Before I get into the sermon testimony um, type thing, I'd like to pose a question to each and every single one of us. Um, and that question is, who are you? It's a very simple question. It's three words. And, and I think that we have all um, have, you know, had that question posed towards us, um, whether that be at work, whether that be at school, whether that be um, at church, in ministry, or whether that just be in family, who are you? You know, um, when, when you think about it, um, for instance, if, if we're going to talk about work um, or, or job-related things, if, if you came up to an individual and you were speaking to them and you were like, wait, who are you? Right, and this individual responds, "Oh, I'm I'm the CEO of Amazon." Um, well, in general, I don't think you would ask that question because I think we all know who the CEO of Amazon is. Um, it's Bill Gates. But <laughs> I'm just messing. Um, but the idea is that that response from that individual, if they told you those things, would have been like, "Whoa, I'm standing with the CEO of Amazon." or Microsoft, or whatever else, right? That would be a lot different from a circumstance if you walked up to an individual and you said, hey, uh, who are you? And they said, oh, I'm, I'm a level one employee at Amazon or at Microsoft. Um, and it, it's, it's no disrespect to the person. It just the reality is, is that that question, who are you, is less about you, but it's more for the person who's asking the question. They want to know, why do you matter in this world? Why are you different in this world? And why should I really care about you in the first place? Right? Um, and so through this, through this sermon, I'd like to place on the table three points. And the first point is, what, who are you? And specifically, what is your identity? What is your status what kind of authority are you walking in? And why are you important? You know, um, I'm not, some of you know me as Olga's cousin. And some of you know me as just Oleg who just walked out and has been in Tanzania. Others of you know me from childhood, watching me grow up. Um, but when I look at myself and, and I look at people who look at me at my church, my dad, he's not the pastor of my church, um, but he is one of the pastors at the church. And I've noticed that walking into the church, being one of the kids of one of the pastors at the church, there is some kind of pressure that lies on me just walking into the service, just walking into the sanctuary, where perhaps on one end, it is the idea that... Um, Oleg, there are more eyes watching you, so be careful with what you're going to say. Oleg, there's more eyes looking at you, so be careful what you're going to do and, and how you might treat somebody. But on the other hand, it's also uh, an aspect of what Oleg is going to say, whether it is from my, par my, my, my father's influence, it has a little bit more weight because of my father. Right, And I'd like for us to, to think about the question, who are you, not in a sense of, I could ask my cousin Olga, who are you, and she could tell me her job profession. But today I'd like to think about that question, not in a sense of school or job or ministry, but rather in a spiritual sense towards God. I would hope that the majority of us, and in fact, I would hope that the, the whole of us would be able to confidently say that I am a child of God, right? But the reality is, is that um, those, that question and that answer, it, it needs a response. Even after you respond, you need to, to show it with your life. You see, um, in Africa um, and in Ukraine, I don't know what it was, but I know that that question to me personally was asked several times. 
not on a physical level even, on, on the sense of who are you with, your, with people's words, but on a spiritual sense, whether it was um, evil forces or whether it was spirit or whether it was the Holy Spirit. But I got asked that question several times. And there was a specific moment that resonated in my mind. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that I will, I don't think I will ever forget it. And it was a moment when Vitaly and I, we knocked in a person's house. And I believe this was the last house that we were going to go to and preach at for that day. And I think that we were thinking that, you know, we're going to speak with this individual as, as we spoke with other individuals. Hopefully, we'd be able to bring them to Christ. If they had any needs, we would pray for them, and they would be healed um, as, as in former times. And I don't think we were, I think we were spiritually, mentally ready for that circumstance, but I don't think we were expecting that. And so as we were there and we were discussing the gospel and, and after asking them, you know, do you have any needs? Do you understand what we just explained to you? The individuals, um, they seemed like they agreed. And it says we're like about to get ready to go and, you know, get out and we're going to pray for them and then leave. And I don't know what it is about Tanzanians, but they like to hold all the good secrets all the way to the very end. Um, and so at the very end, right about, right before we're about to pray, one of the ladies, there were three of them, she begins to tell us uh, of a difficulty that she's going through, that at night, she has these nightmares, these dreams, where, and it, it's a, on a consistent basis, where she sees people come into her room, and they sexually abuse her and rape her. And they're always male bodies, but they're always different faces of people that she knows, right? And Vitaly and I are sitting there, and to be honest with you guys, I knew that the demonic world is real. I knew that the spiritual world is real. But personally, I never knew that, that demons have their own sense of order, in a sense of you demons take care of these people, and you demons take care of those people. And I never knew that there were demons that pertain to specific sexual activity. Um, but, of course, as any other missionary would, that didn't stop me in my circumstance to be like, oh, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you, right? In that circumstance, I was like, well, with Vitaly, we were like, well, who can answer the question? And that's only Jesus Christ. And so we begin to talk to her and explain to her that, hey, Jesus can deliver you from this. Those demons, if we pray for you, they will, um, they will flee by the name of Jesus, and they will get out of you, and that you, you will never have to be tormented by these things ever again. Do you want those things? And she agreed, and she said, yeah, I would love for you guys to pray. But she, it was a whole different thing. So we, we, we moved to a different location because uh, of, of a fear of her husband, and because it's a Muslim country, right? And so... When we got to the other place and we begin to pray, um, it was obvious after a good moment that this isn't something that she's made up. It's not some kind of fairy tales. It's not things that, it's no longer something that you read in scripture or you watch on videos or stories that you hear about. This is real life right in front of you where you see the demon begin to manifest in front of you. And... You know, it got real, even more real for me when the demon is manifesting and then out of a, all of a sudden calms down, just plain face, and then begins to smile in your direction. It, it, it gets to a point where you're, you, you understood that the spiritual world is real, but you understand even more so that it's not, it's not games and the person isn't just feeling uncomfortable, the person is really demon-possessed. And what it got even more serious and what really underlined it all was a moment when we were holding the, demon, uh, the, the person down and we're praying over the individual. And I watch her as I'm, uh, as I'm praying um, because it's never a good idea to close your eyes while you're praying for a demon for this person. Just, just sorry. Just so that you know. Um, and so we're watching her as we're praying, 
And we see that she be just begins to scan the room with her eyes. And at one point, she, looking across the room, she locks eyes with me. And in this moment, you understand that I'm, I'm looking at an individual, but I'm not looking at the person. Like, I'm not having a, a staring down cost, contest with that individual, but rather I am looking eye to eye, straight dead in the eye with a demon. And in that moment, it wasn't, uh, it's hard to explain, but I felt this, this spiritual pressure around me. And from that spiritual uh, circumstance, I felt a question ring out to me. And the question was this, who do you think you are? And honestly, I, I, I had this kind of this anger build up in my heart, um, like a spiritual kind of a reverence to God. And I responded, I was like, who do I think I am? Who do you think you are to ask me who do I think I am? And the reality was that I was able to, and there's no boasting in myself. It's all boasting in Christ. The reality is, is that I was able to say those things because I'm founded on Christ. Because I knew who was filling me and who had filled me. I knew who was leading me and that it wasn't some uh, emotional or just Oleg's conscience. It wasn't any, any evil spirits, but it was the one true God, the Holy Spirit who had filled me and was working powerfully through me. And that was why I could look at that demon and be like, no, 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 you're not going to ask me, but I'm going to speak to you and you're going to obey in the name of Jesus and you're going to get out, right? And, and it's interesting that after that moment, something that Vitaly and I picked up because an inter the similar thing happened to Vitaly. And the idea is that afterwards, we noticed that we would be standing on one side and the individual, the demon, would be looking the opposite direction. And then we walk onto the other side and the, the demon would be looking the other way. Because there is a, there is a, a, a shift in the atmosphere. Because the demons understand that this individual, these individuals, they're not normal individuals, but they are children of God, walking in the power of God. You know, why, I, why do I bring these things up? And it, it reminds me of the story of, of, of Paul in uh, the Ephesian church. Uh, when he's, uh, this is Acts chapter 19, if you have your Bibles with you, um, verses 11 through 20. And it says the following. It says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs of aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jews, exorcists, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And scripture later tells us in the following verses that the, that demon, possessed man, mastered the rest of those, all seven, and led them out fleeing naked. You see, I would, I, I pray and I hope that we as, as, as believers in this church, in your church, in my church, that we would come to the understanding that Paul wasn't a favored child of God. He wasn't an anomaly. He wasn't a special condition. But the same power, the same spirit of God that worked through him and mightily through him is the same spirit that lives in every single one of you. In fact, Paul stresses it so much that he underlines it to several churches. In, in Romans, uh, if we flip to chapter 8, verse 11, it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead 
dwells in you who raised Christ Jesus from the dead. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And praying for the Ephesian church in uh, chapter 1, verse, uh, it's verse 19. It says, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. If we were to just understand that the Holy Spirit isn't just an object, he isn't just some person of God who is out there, but he is the same power that hovered across the whole universe from the beginning, who created the universe being God. And that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and put him into that power, into that dominion, that now today we can pray to God and have confidence in him. That same Holy Spirit power that formed millions of galaxies lives within you and works mightily through you. The question is today, do, you, do we know? Do I know who I am? You know, that leads me to my second point. And the second point is, who are you? And specifically, what capabilities do you have? You know, when we look at a doctor, for instance, and we come up to a doctor, but we don't know that they're a doctor, right? And we say, who are you? And the person says, oh, I'm a doctor. We understand that, okay, well, there's, there's a title to it, right? The person has authority, and the person has um, a status where it's respected, it's honored. But more than that, we understand that a doctor or if we to look at a lawyer or an engineer or an architect, it's not only their status that gives them uh, that honor and that respect, but what they can do gives them even more honor and more respect. A doctor, for instance, can help people, can cure people, knows how to treat an individual based on the, the circumstance of that person's body. And likewise, you could, we can go through the list of what a lawyer can do, what an engineer and an architect can do, all these different things. And it's important, it's vital that we as Christians understand if we call ourselves children of God, that we don't understand only that I walk in the authority of the Holy Spirit, that I walk in the authority of Jesus Christ, but we understand as children of God what that means, what is allowed to me, what can I do as a child of God. And I think for that, we should jump to what Jesus speaks about, how, what he says about us. And this is in uh, Mark chapter 16. This is right before Jesus ascends. But he, his last words, I believe any person's last words, the last words of David, Jacob, we take a little bit more value to what they say. Because it's, it's that sentimental moment of, I'm about to leave, but I want to leave you with something important. And one of the last words that he says in verse 17, he says, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. You see... We need to understand as Christians that as ambassadors of Christ, as children of God, we are that face to the world who Christ is. And that means that if Christ walked around in, in authority and he placed that authority on us, we got to walk in that. And Jesus saying that, hey, you're going to do the same things that I did and even greater things that means that we don't put that onto the shelf and just, oh, I'm going to walk as a Christian in that authority and good morals and good standards, but I also am beneficial to the communities, the neighborhoods, the, the countries, the states that are around me for the glory of God. 
That means that when we see an individual who is sick and struggling, I'm not against doctors, I'm not against surgeons, I'm not against those problems. But the reality is, is that the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit is much greater and much stronger that lives within each and every single one of us than any doctor, than any surgeon, than any uh, therapist. And this individual, when they come up to you, it should be your capability as a child of God to speak life into that person, to pray in the name of Jesus, be healed. And it happens. Not because of how awesome we are, not because Oleg said so, but because God said so. Because God said that you will lay hands and they will be healed. That you will speak to a demon in the name of Jesus and they will flee and get out. Why? Because of what Jesus did. Right? But I think that it's, it's another aspect to it that is very important beyond the helping of other people. The healing of other people, the casting out of demons, the breaking of curses, those are all awesome things. And it's important to remember those things. But I think sometimes it feels as though that, oh, Jesus, you want me to take care of other people, and, and, and that's it. But the reality is that Jesus doesn't only care about the people around you, but he cares about his very children. Where scripture tells us in, in, in 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, where it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of a sound, disciplined mind. You see, we're not out there, we're not here in this world just to be representatives and walking in the authority of God, performing miracles to glorify His name, not our own, but we're also to show what God can do to an individual. Where no longer I have to be bent to slavery, to sin. No longer do I have to be bent to fear or to wickedness. No longer do I have to be afraid. But now, by the Spirit of God that lives within me, I am filled with the love, a love of God. Now I am filled with a spirit of joy. A spirit of joy that is not of my own, but of the Lord, His joy. A spirit, that is, a spirit of, of peace that comes from the Holy Spirit God's peace. Jesus says, not as the world do I give you the peace, but I give you my peace. These are things that, these are things that we can share with the people. Why? Because we are children of God. This is why you're special. This is what you can give to the world as, your, as, 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 as a title that you hold as a child of God. It's not just some random thing that we proclaim in, in church just to connect ourselves with God. It is something that God proclaims over your life when you give your life to Jesus. And I would, I would hope that we as a church would grow in that. I as an individual would understand and believe it more and act in it more and, and live it out more every single day of my life, understanding that it's not just something, but it is what God called me to. And I need to live that wherever I am, whether I'm in Tanzania, whether I'm here at home, at a job, at school, wherever, to my family, to my coworkers. I am a child of God. I, I got to walk in that authority. And if there are struggles or needs, I point them to Christ. And Christ works through me by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'd like to, to, to wrap that point up with my last point, and that's point number three. Beyond looking at the, the title of the individual and what, uh, and if, if they're, for instance, a doctor or a lawyer, that means that they have cer certain capabilities, certain things that they can do. Beyond those two things, there's a third thing that we look upon, and that is what got them there. You see, we don't just respect doctors because they're just doctors and they know what they're doing. But we respect doctors because they went through medical school and eight plus years after that or before that, I don't know how it works, but the reality is that they go through a lot of schooling to be trained and ready to get to that final destination. Likewise, lawyers, likewise, any other architect, they go through law school, they go through their schooling. Why? To get that education, to be trained, to be ready and to be uh, an effective lawyer, doctor, whatever else. And so when it comes to us and, and, and our circumstance, our status, right? The question is, okay, awesome. You are a child of God. 
you have that status. I, I, I understand you claim that you can, you can perform these things in the name of Jesus Christ and that the demons and the evil spirits, they'll obey because of Jesus' name. But the question is, what? What proves that? What got you to that place? What gives you the audacity or the confidence to even be able to proclaim these things so confidently before people or the people around you? And that, that is something that Vitaly and I ran into several times. You know, when we were in Africa, we, it wasn't like we just experienced that demon-possessed woman once, and that was it. When we were in Ukraine, it wasn't the same thing where we just experienced one circumstance, and that was it. But the reality is, is that we experienced time after time the pressures uh, of the mission field. And I'm not trying to bestow any honor to us. It all is for the glory of God. And the idea is that there were times that, for instance, there was a brother that we ran into. His name was John. Now, John proclaimed and professed that he was a Christian. But John had a problem with his hearing, and he couldn't hear. And first time when we walked up and we began to pray for him, I did what any other Christian would do, and I began to pray for the healing of his ears, because I understood he's a Christian. But as, as we begin to pray for John and to proclaim healing over him in Jesus' name, I noticed a little twitch, you know? And I'm like, well, that's not what people do. People are normal people. They can control themselves. And it, it became apparent to me that it's not a physical need. It's not a physical problem, but it's a, a demon problem. And so the idea, and, and so we begin to proclaim Jesus Christ over that individual and cast out those demons to the point where even John began to gag and throw up letting those demons out of his life. And, and soon after, our translator who had contact with the individual, with, with John, lets us know that John is f hearing completely fine in his left ear. And in, in his right ear, it's, it's hurting a little bit, and there's stuff coming out, but he is filled with a joy, with a peace, because that bitterness, because that evil, because that wickedness was cast away. It was wonderful for us to see when, when a, an elderly lady comes up to us in a chair. She sits down because she has pain in her knees. She has pain in her legs, and it hurts for her to walk, for her to stand. And so she asks us to pray, and we begin to pray for her and, and to pray in Jesus' name that those knees would be restored in Jesus' name. And we, we see quite literally in front of our eyes, how she is an elderly lady in pain and she begins to get up and begin to walk and, and, and run circles around Vitaly as we begin to glorify his name and as, as, as the pain just begins to rush away from her body. We saw a, a, a different individual who the first time we came to her, she was just laying on her bed and, and she had been in a horrific um, motorcycle accident, breaking her leg and causing her to have surgery and, and to have a metal piece placed into her leg. This individual struggled with even life. And it, it, it seemed as though she was waiting for life to just be over. She was waiting just to die. And we, we came to this individual several days but what was, what was beautiful was that day after day, the first day she's on her bed and laying, the second day she's sitting upright, the third day she's, she's already cooking her own food, and on the fourth day we, we get, she, she's walking around and, and, and being able to, to get her own stuff as we speak with her, with her little nephew and different things. This isn't us. It's not what, what Oleg or Vitaly could do. It wasn't any other brothers or pastors there. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. When speaking to an older lady who is paralyzed, had a stroke, and of course we want healing over her. But we understand that more than the healing, what she needs right now is salvation because who knows when the last second of her life is. 
And it was that beautiful moment, the last time we were able to see her, when we said, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And she said, yeah, I would love to do that. You see, these things only, only can happen because of what Jesus did. And, and that was the reality was that when we were praying for these individuals, we were not praying in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We did pray that. And we did pray by the blood of Jesus, and we proclaimed those things. But to those things, we added what Jesus did, what, what, what Jesus taught us to do. And we began to pray and proclaim Scripture and begin to proclaim what God has done for us. You see, we are not special, and, and we are not somebody because of our goodness and of our awesomeness. I or Vitaly, we didn't get that title because of who, how cool we are. And, and the capabilities that we could do, they didn't come from us. But it came from Jesus Christ coming down 2,000 years ago, living a perfect life. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4 says that he was tempted in every respect, but he did not sin a single time. And then after that, after 33 years of perfectly living, Scripture tells us that it was pleasing to God to put him on the cross and to make him be sin, who knew no sin, so that through him, I, you, could be made, could be the righteousness of God. And that wasn't the end of the story. Because then Jesus Christ said these powerful three words. And he said, it is finished. It's done. The work is over and there's nothing left to do. You know, it would have been, it would have been sad and it would have been anti anticlimactic if that was the end. If Jesus said it is finished and that was it. But Jesus, when he was buried three days later, he didn't, he didn't stay in the grave but he left the grave empty. And that same power that lives, that raised him from the dead now lives in us. Now Jesus, he didn't just rise from the dead just to, just to rub it in our face. Jesus rose from the dead proving that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That everything that he said was not a lie, but it is fact, and that there's only one way to the Father, and that is through him. And is what's even more beautiful today is that Jesus stands next to the Father. And he stands interceding on my behalf, on your behalf. And when we come to the Father and we say, Father, forgive us, Jesus shows his blood and he says, I paid for them. That's my son, that's my daughter. I paid for them. And their sins are forgiven. God no longer sees our sin, but he sees us in the righteousness of Christ. And what's beautiful is that that isn't the end of the story again. Jesus could have stopped it there and that's it and let us live millions and millions of lives here on this earth. But Jesus says, no, 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 I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you home. Why? Because you're my child and I want to be with you for all of eternity. I want you to be an impact here on earth. I want you to know that you're my child and so that the people know you're my child by working mightily, mighty miracles through you and show people that it is because of what I did on that cross. You see, being a child of God, it's not just a, a title, but it's a status that comes with authority, that comes with power, and that comes with the story of the one true king. And his name is Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the reality is this. I'd like, if you may, stand up with me. We're going to go into a prayer soon. But here's the reality that the spiritual world isn't just real out there in, the, in a third world country. The spiritual world is very much real here today in this country. And in every single nation, it doesn't matter where you are. And the question is, that I'd like to pose again to us today, who are you? If you're a child of God, I'm not going to ask you right now to prove it and just start doing miracles. But perhaps through the service, through the sermon, 
you felt as the Holy Spirit spoke to you. And perhaps through the worship you heard as, as the Lord was calling to you. And you'd like to respond today, here I am, Lord. I'm available, and I want you to use me. As Isaiah spoke before the Lord, here I am, send me. It doesn't have to be a, through a third world country. God, send me to my family. Send me to my friends. Send me to my co-workers, to my colleagues, to my classmates. Why? Because I want to walk in that authority. I want to walk in that power. I want to walk in that love. I want to walk in that peace of disciplined mind. I want to walk in those miracles that you have prepared for me. I want to proclaim your name to my coworkers and everybody around me so that your name would be glorified and not my own. So brothers and sisters, as we go into a prayer, if today you would like to make that decision, to give your life completely to Christ, it would be my greatest honor to lead you in that. But perhaps it's not a, a day when you want to give your life to Christ, but you want to renew that, renew that status with the Spirit. Renew that status with God and say, God, Lord, perhaps I've smudged it and messed with the name and, and it doesn't look that way. I want you to enlighten me. I want you to empower me and change my life to truly reflect that authority of a child of God, that I might walk in it courageously, boldly glorifying your name.